Welcome to At Issue. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm H. Wayne Wilson. And for those of you who follow downtown Peoria and the warehouse district immediately to the south of downtown, you may be saying, yeah, we've been talking about that for a long time. And that's true. Well, some progress is being made, some visible progress is being made. And we're going to be talking to three individuals directly involved in that process. I'd like to welcome Chris Setti to the conversation. Chris is the assistant city man manager for the city of Peoria with a focus, amongst other things, on the warehouse district. Thanks for being with Thank us. Thank you. Across the table from Chris is Michael Freilinger. Michael is president of Peoria Downtown Development. We'll talk a little bit about what that is in a moment, but thank you for joining us. Thank you. And also here is a developer by the name of Mike Chahosky. Mike is with APG. He is the CEO of that organization. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. And before we move forward, uh, Peoria Downtown Development, a, a, a 25 words or less description. Uh, the Downtown Development Corporation of Peoria, which we refer to as the DDC, is uh, a private, uh, uh, not-for-profit organization. Um, we cooperate with the city um, to represent the stakeholders in the downtown. Uh, our main focus is to promote the development of the downtown, which includes the warehouse district, the riverfront district, and the central business district. And this is something to me, just on the surface, sounds a little bit like what the Economic Development Department at the city did to some degree. And that, that whole situation has been changed now. Uh, it, to a degree. You know, the, the Downtown Development Corporation is actually a best practice of, uh, you know, uh, that we see in, in urban communities across the country. Uh, it was actually referenced in the implementation plan that we approved a couple of years ago in forming a group that really is completely focused on downtown and warehouse district development. The city's economic development department obviously has a lot of, um, a lot of interaction in that regard, but we, we are in charge of economic development for the entire city. So Michael and his staff, his board and his volunteers wake up every day and that's all they do is, uh, is um, try to represent the stakeholders, um, you know, do marketing, bring people to the table, and then interact with the city when it comes to making deals happen. Before we get into the specifics of the warehouse district and what the future holds, maybe a little bit of a history lesson for our audience might be beneficial. You mentioned the implementation plan. Leading up to that, in 2002, there was the Duani Heart of Peoria plan. In 2006, Farrell Madden came out with form-based code. 2007, the warehouse district TIF was formed. 2009, Synergicity, which was a University of Illinois study, talked about being innovation-based uh, for the economy. 2011, the comprehensive plan. And in November 2012, this publication came out, the Peoria Warehouse District Implementation Plan that Chris referred to. And it, uh, there were recommendations for the Downtown Development Organization. And in fact, in 2013, uh, on board came the, the uh, Development uh, uh, Corporation. So all three of you, give me your assessment of where we are in terms of, with this as background, 2002, we were talking about, wouldn't it be great if, where are we? I think we're in a very good position right now. We've seen a lot of uh, improvements already. Uh, key to what we want to do in the downtown, um, one of our main focuses is the warehouse district. We've seen the streetscape improvements on Washington, Adams, and Jefferson uh, be completed. They're wrapping up uh, uh, th those improvements right now. And those are key to developers' interest in coming into the warehouse district and making a substantial investment. We're also seeing at least four projects within the warehouse district that are in that stage of getting ready for construction. Uh, a couple of them are either doing a demolition or are in the construction phase, and Mike's project will be moving forward uh, very soon as well. So um, we are seeing that we're at a point where um, uh, momentum is behind the project. We, the city has worked together and put to, um, in place the historic 
district and that was named to the National Registry, which makes it much easier to use historic tax credits to redevelop these historic buildings. And we'll talk about historic tax credits in just a moment, but first, your take on where are we, Chris? You, you know, I think everybody would love for us to be further than we are, but things sometimes take time, and we really did get sidetracked by the economy from about 2009 through 2012. Um, where uh, not only just a lo the local economic climate was one thing, but just the way that banks started to approach lending and financing of projects in the and you know and so it really it kind of took us all uh, on, a, on a little side path there. Uh, but really, in the meantime, what we really did focus in on was the was the roads and the infrastructure. And so the city, you know, in co with the combination of federal, state, and local funding. Um, has uh, invested about $25 million into the roads in, in downtown in the warehouse district, which I think has been really a great way of setting the frame for the picture that we want the private developments to then, then paint. And so all of that work is, is done other than some punch list things. And so I think that's been important. And, and we have started to see, as Michael pointed out, the momentum pick up with um, not only redevelopment agreements signed and work being done, uh, but a, just a tremendous amount of interest in um, the warehouse district in particular, downtown as well, um, from both uh, local developers like a, um, uh, a, uh, APG, 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 I almost said ADG, APG, uh, as well as uh, regional developers and even some national developers. Uh, roadways have been mentioned by the two individuals. Was that part of the incentive for you to say Murray Building, and we'll talk about Mike's project here in just a moment, but the roadways, were they critical in making a decision? Not necessarily for the Murray Building. We're a little bit unique uh, because we are the last building on the waterfront that didn't. But obviously, we are looking to have a mixed-use building with retail and commercial in there, so having an improved roadway system is definitely a benefit. I think the bigger things that Michael and Chris have pointed out to the city uh, has done a nice job building a foundation that we as developers can then take on the private side and build from. So things like the tax incentives, the TIF, all of those things. And now with the improving economy, I think we're at the position where we could start to invest into these buildings. And once we have some successes, I think we'll start to see some real momentum behind the future investments. Let's talk about some of those incentives, Chris. Uh, can you give us just a thumbnail sketch of what has been put in place in order to incentivize these projects? Sure. Well, we understand that the, the cost difference between building something in a former cornfield uh, in the suburbs or in, or in the northern or western part of Peoria is much less expensive than the renovation of a big old historic building. And so, uh, you know, we recognized that back even in 2007 with the creation of, of the TIF. And so uh, we've, we've tried to put in place a number of different incentives to allow that private development to kind of blend down the cost, that difference between building something brand new in an area, um, you know, outside of of town versus doing this. So there are a couple of incentives. One is a, a very a relatively simple one and it's called the Rivers Edge Redevelopment Zone. It, it provides for the waiver of sales taxes on building materials in a particular uh, in this particular area. We have a tax increment financing district which allows us to um, capture some the new property taxes that are generated from development itself um, to either pledge back to the development in terms of an incentive uh, and or to use within the district itself to do things uh, like the um, like the road, so that for example, the the Tiger project was a ten million dollar federal grant, but it was matched with three point four million dollars of TIF money, uh, you know, to to finalize those uh, those roads. I think maybe the thing that we worked the hardest on was the creation of the state historic tax credit. Illinois is one of only a handful of states that didn't have a historic tax credit uh, for the qualified renovation of these older historic structures. So that, uh, that first required a change in state law to allow that to happen. It's on a limited basis in just five communities, Peoria being one of those five. Um, and then also there's a historic tax credit, I'm sorry, a federal historic tax credit that is almost identical. One is uh, the federal tax credit is, is worth 25, 20 percent of, of the total cost of renovation and the state one at 25 percent. But that required, in addition to changing the state law to make that happen, that the, that the warehouse district be on the National Register of Historic Places. Uh, so we've done that as well in creating a nationally registered historic district 
that allows those buildings to qualify for these tax credits. Those, those are in place, but Michael, the state historic tax credit expires. That's a temporary or yeah. maybe experimental, I think. It was a pilot point. project that was scheduled, um, I think it was for five years, and it's scheduled to expire at the end of 2016. One of the challenges that we have is um, we're coming out of a recession and a downturn in the housing market, so we're just beginning the process. We used a lot of that pilot project time period where there was no development going on. So what we would like to do is partner with the city and try to get those uh, that pilot project extended. And the reason that's important is if you're doing a project and all of the work is not going to be completed um, by 2016, you begin to start losing the benefit of those state historic tax credits. So if the state were able to extend those, then a project that is going to have a, let's say, a two or three year construction phase, they can take full advantage of that for that whole, whole time period. Mike, have you taken advantage of that? We're investigating it right now. It's, it's one of the challenges associated with the historic tax credit is it is relatively new, so we don't have a track record with it. So we can't say that we're going to use it for sure until we get we have to submit plans to the state. We then have to submit it federally and get all of those approved. Well, we can't do that until we have our design completed. We can't get our design until we have our financing. Financing doesn't want us to use the historical tax credit. So there's a lot of moving parts that have to work together. But I think as Michael and Chris pointed out, it's a great tool and once we start to build some history with this, I think it, it's something that definitely is very attractive to our equity investors in the project. Was the Murray Building, did it take advantage of historic tax credits for the state? We haven't yet. I mean, we plan to. We plan to apply for them. And, and you would follow up, you would be completed before the expiration? That's correct. So we should be done before it expires in 2016. That being said, we're uh, in due diligence on another building in the warehouse district that clearly would fall outside of that. So it's very important to us that this right. does get extended. Uh, for the audience's benefit, maybe we should describe the Murray Building project. Everybody's going to be familiar with Murray Jewelers was there at one time. Most recently, it was uh, Artists Lofts. Um, what's going to happen? So well, one, one, one thing has already happened. So. Yeah, one thing's already happened. Rodell is open, doing really well. Uh, in fact, they're having some, some of their best uh, operations they've ever had. So we're really thrilled to have them as an anchor on our first floor within the building. And now the next phase is to really look at the rest of it. And it's not just the Murray Building. The Murray Building's the prime building, primary building. And it's four stories, approximately 20,000 square feet per floor. And we're going to have on the first floor, Rodell anchoring it. It takes up about 25% of the first floor. Then we have uh, other retail and commercial uses. We're in discussions with another restaurant that likely will be uh, signing an agreement with us shortly to come on the first floor. Second floor, we're looking at commercial. And then the top two floors, residential, which will allow us to have approximately 32 units residential and then a rooftop deck on top of it to take advantage of the views of the river. Rental or condo? Those are all rental. And, we, and the point I would bring, as I started with, is it's not just the Murray building, that's our primary, but we're developing the, redeveloping the entire block, which includes the 512 Southwest Washington building, which is a real great building, uh, old car dealership, been there for a long time, and we're looking at uh, commercial retail in that space as well. So what is the market for rental versus condo in the warehouse district, well, or, or include this, the downtown as well? Yeah, the, um, the Tracy Cross site that was commissioned by the city and uh, I think the CEO council or the tri uh, river planning organization, anyway, um, uh, they've found that it, there's a demonstrated need for about 210 new units every year for the foreseeable future. So that's the demand. Most of those, about 90% of those, are for uh, rental properties, um, the rental market. And, and then the balance would be for um, uh, condominiums. Um, so that's where the demand is today. And that could change as uh, the warehouse district begins to develop and, and fully um, more residents moving in down there. That, that mix may change, but at this point in time, the, the greatest need, um, as identified in those studies, is for rental. Chris, uh, there's uh, the uh, Civic Center Plaza building, 12-story mm -hmm. building that's across the street from the Civic Center. It's be, the floors 2 through 11 are being converted. Will that impact that 200 uh, units a year? 
No, I, first of all, I mean, they already have 110 or so units in there, and those all were in there when, the, uh, when these reports were, for, uh, were, were created. And so I think they're adding maybe another 20 or 30 units. So I think it's a drop in the bucket. I think there's a lot of pent-up demand in the downtown market, and it's a, it's a demand that's likely only growing just based on, on the demographics and, and what you're seeing nationally. This isn't a Peoria phenomenon. You're seeing small towns uh, and small urban centers like Peoria, South Bend, Dubuque, Iowa. Uh, all of these places are kind of ha under the same pressures to kind of revitalize their urban cores, and, and, it's, and it's largely a generational issue. Uh, so I, I think that, you know, we would welcome all sorts of uh, new construction and the renovation of, of existing buildings in downtown and the warehouse district because we just see that much demand. You're confident that uh, 32 rental units in the Murray Building is no problem in getting those rented? No, we, we don't see any issue with that at all. Looking at the future, yeah. Caterpillar has announced that they're going to expand their it may remain in downtown Peoria and actually expand from about 2,000 or so employees to 3,000 mm -hmm. employees in their new world headquarters. Many of those will be the target market. Yeah. So how does that impact the warehouse and downtown? Well, it, it's the primary reason why this is so important. It's, it's not just because um, we think it would be cool to have people living in the warehouse district. It's because it's important to businesses and the growth of this whole entire region. Employers know that in order to attract young professionals, we need to have an urban environment for them to move into. Kids uh, marry later, they start families later, um, they want to interact, they want to be in a place where they can um, be with their peers, and they want to be in an environment where they can walk and not need a car. So urban environments are where we see a great demand for for employers to move to, for employees to live in, so they can be closer to their work and be in this exciting environment. And, Walk, H, and go ahead, if Chris. I could just add something, you know, we, we talk obviously a lot about the the importance of our downtown employers and our generally downtown employers, the hospitals being, you know, a major part of that as well. But uh, one thing that I think is often overlooked is the proximity of the CityLink bus transfer center. Mm -hmm to the warehouse district. I mean, it's two or three blocks from the Murray building, right. from a lot of these places. And because we run a hub and spoke system, right, where every bus in, in town comes to one spot there at the corner of Kumpf and Jefferson, um, that's very important so that if you're at Mossville, if you're at the tech center in Mossville, or you know, you're working elsewhere in the community, it's very easy to walk two blocks, three blocks, hop on one bus and take you to where you want to go. We're seeing increased ridership in, in public transportation, not only locally, but nationally again, for some of the same reasons, a, a generational issue of not wanting to own a car or, or not wanting to drive everywhere. So this walkability that Michael referred to is you're you're actually taking steps in the warehouse district in downtown to make it more walkable, make it more uh, bicycle safe. Yes. So we, I mean, first of all, the the streetscape project that we spent so much uh, money on it was really about walkability and, and creating a pedestrian scale environment. So it was, you know, if you looked at the 800 block of Washington Street, there was no, almost no sidewalk on the north side of that street, on the city side, we call it the river side or the city side, of that street. It had completely disintegrated. So some of it was just about rebuilding and, and expanding sidewalks. We're putting bike lanes in, uh, in, on Adams and Jefferson. Kind of related to the warehouse district, we've been going through a kind of a master streetscape process for downtown now, because we see what we've done with the warehouse district. We want to be able to connect that to downtown. Well, let's talk about streets in the warehouse district, because we know that essentially that Tiger project is complete. Mm -hmm. Those streets have all been redone, yet there are barrels all <laughs> over the place. Why? Well, we're just waiting for some final authorization. Our plan has been to um, create uh, Adams and Jefferson, uh, I think it's between I'll say it's generally between Oak Street and Persimmon to be two-way streets. And so we're just waiting for final approval uh, from the Illinois Department of Transportation to stripe those roads as two ways. And so that's why those barrels are up right now is because we didn't want to do, we don't want to stripe it as one way and then turn around and then have to pull up those markings and stripe it the other way. And that requires IDOT approval. Correct, because they're in control of the, of the, of the money that pass through them from the federal government And to the us. two streets that are impacted are? Adams and Jefferson. What will Washington be? Washington's already two-way, two so it'll, it'll, it'll stay two-way. Right. Yes. Oh, okay. All right. Um, 
Let me uh, talk real briefly uh, about the Murray Building Project again because, and, and everyone can participate in this uh, particular uh, topic because artists have been very critical uh, to the renovation of the warehouse district. Right across from your office, Absolutely. there's artists, and there are many artists' lofts in the Murray Building. Those people are being displaced. Is there concern that the artists will be will be displaced and and move out and and you'll lose a component of the vibrancy of well it's something that we don't want to happen and uh, but it's it's part of the natural progression of development obviously um, but we have um, partnered with the city and I know the development group is also uh, trying to uh, find adequate um, place for those uh, tenants to move to. But we, we've assisted, for example, one of the businesses has moved down the street um, on Washington. Um, EDI is now there and have relocated. We are currently engaged with um, three entities that are looking at the possibility of doing artist loft uh, live workspaces. Um, so we're, we're trying to um, accommodate that need because it is important. It's part of the culture that makes it an exciting place to live. So I think that we will see uh, a project or two in the warehouse district specifically designed to keep artists in the uh, warehouse district, not only to, to work, but to live. In renovating the, in, is it the Murray building or the Stuber building? <laughs> it depends on who you talk to, I think. <laughs> it, it's the Stuber building by the National Historic Register, right. so we have to keep that, but it's known locally as the Murray building to the community. Okay, and the Murray family is still involved in the development? Absolutely. Um, now, I, I want to explain, Chris, if you would, the, the, the TIF district the developer gets a 50% rebate of the property tax, of the, of the increase in property tax. Right, so, when, and, and, and we, we, that's the way we have set it up. It, it, in a TIF district, the way that, that it works is that the, that the value of the building for property tax purposes is frozen, theoretically frozen, mm -hmm. um, at the, day, the time that the TIF is created. And then any increase in value due to the development, or even due to the inflationary pressures, but generally from, uh, you know, from, from development, is the taxes that are associated with that increment in, in value is captured in a special fund. So the, the taxing districts get what they've always had from that property. For the, the 23 for the, years. For the, yeah, for the, yeah, for the next 23 years. They, they, they are held harmless there. And then the increase in property taxes is captured by a fund that the city can use in a variety of ways. There are about 17 different categories of, of things that, uh, that a city can it, spend it on. But it, one it, of them is to, uh, to uh, create rebates to a developer for their eligible costs. And that's a 50-50 split. Is, is that something that, is, is that okay with you? <laughs> Boy, put me on the well, spot well, here. Well, well no. you want 100%, uh, uh, I know of that. Of course. <laughs> you know, you know we, we've been negotiating with the city on that for a while. It really depends. We believe that each project should stand on its own merits and should be evaluated. Some may deserve more than 50%. Some may deserve less than 50%. The city's asked us to demonstrate why we believe we need more, which we think we have, and we've submitted that to the city, and we're still in the process of negotiating that. And the issue for the city is if you open the barn door... I think there's a couple of issues. One is certainly setting precedent. You know, the R50%, what we call our standard incentive, was meant as a, it's a marketing tool, you know, and, and we've been willing to look at each project, as Mike suggests, on its own merits uh, to, to make sure that the deals can happen, um, but that we have to be judicious about it because we're talking about public resources here as well. So uh, some of it is, is certainly about precedent setting, is that if, if we give somebody 60%, uh, then the next person's going to just assume that's the, new, that's the new standard. So we at least have to have a process for investigating uh, a, a, each particular deal and, and evaluating them. The other reality is, is that the district itself will have financial needs, either, as I suggested. The district as a whole. The district as a whole. Mm -hmm. And so the, 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 the Tiger Project, $10 million in federal money, but $3.4 million in local money. Uh, that, that was used. So I, I, you know, there are, and there are other projects yet need to be done. And H, but I think it's important for the taxpayers to understand that this is all new money. If, right. if, Understood. if, if this no. wasn't, in, uh, mm -hmm. if this program didn't exist, 
the Murray project might not happen or, or none of the other ones. So right. it, even though there is a rebate to the developer, uh, there's going to be a net increase overall Correct. to quick, the taxpayers. A quick final thought. Yep. Down, people want to see the warehouse district happen. And the Murray Baker is wonderful and uh, a couple of other projects that we've talked about. But when's one of the big buildings going to go? It's, uh, you're not going to see one of those big buildings turn until the historic tax credits are extended because they're such an integral part of, of uh, returturning some equity to the investors. I would actually, the Murray building is a pretty big building. Yeah. I mean, well, that's 80,000 square feet. Yeah, 100,000 when you but, both but compared right, so. to the, the seven story ones. Uh, actually, square footage wise, just, yeah. they're just really? about the same. Yeah. Really? So the Murray building is okay. a tremendous, uh, uh, tremendous building. And, and so we'll wait for the historic tax yeah. credit uh, in, in the state of Illinois, it doesn't have anything else on their plate. Right. Uh, let me say thank you to Chris Setti, the assistant city manager for the city of Peoria, and to Mike Jahoski, who is the CEO of APG, a development company. And also say thank you to Michael Freilinger, who is president of Peoria Downtown. Uh, what, what is the, 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 it doesn't have an end to it. Is it corporation or what? Uh, downtown, downtown Development Corporation of Peoria. We just like to call it the DDC. DDC. And with that, we'll say thank you to all three of them. And thank you for joining us in this conversation about the Warehouse District. We'll be back next week with another edition of At Issue. Join us then. <laughs>